so yeah, the second reflection. Uh, we're discussing uh, Expert Sensing Hero versus Expert Intuition uh, Demon uh, in this one, as well as Expert Sensing Parent versus uh, Expert Intuition Trickster, uh, which is also known as the Battleground of Responsibles or Battleground of Responsibility, right? The responsible people, who the responsible people should be, right? Uh, Battleground of Titans is the hero versus the demon. Battleground of Responsibility is the parent versus the trickster. Battleground of Innocence is the child versus the critic, also known as the grandparent in this particular model. And the Battleground of Inhibition, which is also uh, your inferior function versus uh, the nemesis, etc. Uh, I'm going to actually share my screen. Uh, let's see here. Um, is this going to work? I hope this works. Let's see. All right, cool. So I've got my uh, little general outline here uh, in terms of usually how these shows are going to go. Um, but uh, let's actually add in uh, the attitude uh, attitudes here. And then we're going to say uh, hero uh, versus the, the demon, basically, etc. Right, control C. Gonna hit control V, gonna hit control V, gonna hit control V. Excuse me. Whoops. Although these are not all like, you know, the demon and the hero, etc. Whoops, let's not do that, please. Um, inhibition is the inferior. Um, it's actually spelled correctly. I don't know if you guys can read this. I hope you can. But if I zoom in too much, it might make it a little bit more difficult to actually read, so. Let me know if you guys can actually see this. That would be great. Um, child uh, versus the critic. And uh, we are going to have Mr. Chris Taylor join us. Not in the next, not this episode, not the next one, not the next one, but the one after. So I believe that's September uh, for season 18. He's going to be uh, giving a more generalized as well as a more in-depth look at the specific battlegrounds, but how they interact with each other. Uh, not necessarily like what they're doing on their own, but it's more of a, something that is, because uh, sometimes these battlegrounds exist uh, within a person, but they also exist without, like they exist outside of a person. So from person to person, these battlegrounds often uh, have uh, to fight uh, from that uh, point of view. All right, so parent uh, to the trickster. There we go. Awesome. So yeah. But yeah, that uh, should give a general idea of what we're looking for here. And again, hopefully you guys can read that. I imagine you can because I can kind of read it actually on my camera here looking at what the stream looks like. So I'm just going to assume that that's the case. So awesome. So yeah. Um, but anywho. Uh, so let's let's kick off the episode because like, you know, we, we need really long introductions around here because that's what we do best. You know, long introductions, right? So, uh, you know, in season 18, we've discussed cognitive synchronicity. Uh, we've discussed cognitive asynchronicity. We actually have an entire season devoted to cognitive asynchronicity right now. Uh, and uh, cognitive synchronicity and cognitive asynchronicity is basically where, how people's relationships uh, with other people, how they relate to one another. Um, and what this does is this actually can create areas of development. If you develop one function on one end of one axis, the other function will also naturally develop over time, which is awesome. Uh, it's, a, it's a great relationship. So if your inferior function improves, your hero function definitely is going to be improving as well, and conversely the other way around. However, the level of growth and development is not as high for the inferior function. If you're focusing on developing your hero, it's not as high. But if you focus on the inferior function because it is the... Uh, you know, the lesser of the two, definitely the hero function will rapidly grow. Uh, conversely, uh, the parent and the child uh, as well. Although the parent and child has a different relationship because the parent function, while it is the greater of the two, is the one that actually receives a lot of development uh, over time. The thing is, though, is that you still have to focus on developing your parent first to really, really grow the child. And this is this is basically more of an optimistic versus pessimistic functions uh, outlook when it comes to what you have in your ego. You want to develop the pessimistic functions in order to get the optimistic functions to actually follow suit. And that's another way of developing a cognitive axis. Um, so I'm actually going to 
add that to my little outline here just so we have that I may actually release these outlines with the lectures as well we're, we're considering it uh, so yeah um, <clears throat> Okay. Um, now, the reason why you want to, you know, develop your pessimistic functions first to grow the optimistic functions, it's very key. The reason why, the reason why is because you're able to, it, it's, it's like a straight shot to maturity. It's the, um, um, if you want to like fast track your own personal growth as a person, but, uh, but again, you know, optimistic functions, they can kind of take things for granted. They have it a little bit easier than the pessimistic functions, whereas the pessimistic functions are a bit more skeptical as a result. So when it comes to your own cognitive development, utilizing access is very helpful. But then we've also talked about within season 18, the concept of cognitive orbit, where the shadow of uh, your ego, also known as the unconscious, if you can make the unconscious conscious, right? you're going to improve your life and improve everything for you. You're also going to gain wisdom, which is also important. And the unconscious is basically the back door into the ego. And if you develop the unconscious uh, with the ego, uh, use those back doors. Like for example, like what we've been talking about in the How to Parent uh, series at csjoseph.life forward slash members. In the How to Parent series, we've been talking about um, how like for example if you really want to develop a parent function well it's hard to do that with an adolescent because their ego is closed off it, it's completely closed off because their super ego is fully it, it's starting to develop at that point their ego is fully grown and their parent function even though it's a teenager function basically and it's kind of weak it's starting to defend the ego basically so you can't directly develop the parent function so you have to go into the critic function via cognitive orbit develop the critic function uh, of your adolescent basically in order to get them to grow your parent function and if your parent function is underdeveloped if you're cognitive looping all the time uh, meaning looping being that you're a hero and your child loops together uh, objective personality system, people call it uh, cognitive looping. It is a thing that is one area of the science we absolutely agree on. Uh, cognitive looping is a thing and they'll just spin around and it's because they're just ignoring the teenager and the parent. The hero basically is able to overpower the parent because the hero is like, wow, you're just a teenager, who cares? But when the parent is really a parent, the hero will actually start to listen and then the child, the parent will be able to get between the hero and the child's hijinks, basically, which leads to a higher level of mat responsibility and maturity. But in order to get to that area of development, for uh, you have to utilize cognitive orbit to do that, you know, from adolescence on. You don't necessarily have to do that in childhood. However, the parent function is just not there during childhood. It's just not, I mean, it's, it's there, but it's not really doing anything. It's just hasn't grown up yet. So... Keep that in mind. It's it's a it's a really really big deal, and you know, parent functions development overall is usually a good barometer or a good thermometer or something from which a person can measure somebody else's. I don't know. I don't want to say mental health because that's super subjective, and I would never really want to claim that. But uh, understanding a person's cognitive development overall you can actually kind of look at the parent function and get an idea of what they are like. 60 to 80% uh, is covered just by the parent function's level of development. If you know people who have really developed parent functions or you have some examples in your life of people who really develop parent functions, you can compare those to people who don't have as well developed parent functions and you can kind of see where those people are in their journey. You know, and this could actually assist you in making decisions in terms of who you're going to be doing business with or who you're going to marry or who you're going to have children with, etc. Those kinds of big life decisions that involve third parties or other people of some, uh, you know, magnitude within your life and your decision making, look to the parent function. Please look to the parent function to be able to come to that conclusion, right? Uh, one second here. Um, I actually have a... I have to write something down before I forget because I have, um, let's see here. I have a Confessions of an ENTP episode coming up and I'm very much looking forward to it. And it's actually discussing uh, reflector functions in a big way, uh, in, but in a different light. It's actually going super metaphysical, especially from uh, you know spirituality point of view and where reflector functions can actually point the human race in a certain direction, right? 
So uh, more on that later. Um, but anyway, cognitive orbit is another area of development. Now, cognitive reflection and with reflector functions, this comes from uh, Dr. John uh, Beebe, and, uh, which is really important because Dr. John uh, Beebe wrote uh, Energies and Patterns of Psychological Type. If you haven't read the book yet, please read that book. Like seriously, please read that book. It's really short, it's really great. But he talks about the concept of mirror functions uh, within the book. Well, we've named it. We've named it cognitive reflection. The reason why is because we already talk about you know the mirror, you know, with uh, with what Templar types do, etc. But anyway, make sure you guys read that book if you haven't. It is absolutely fantastic. I highly support Dr. John Beebe and his work. And I just you know I'm not getting paid to say this, but please check out his book if you haven't already. Um, so, but when it comes to uh, cognitive reflection, it has a different uh, it has a different point. So there, I would like to make one statement though, you know, real quick. And this comes from, and I forget your name. I'm so sorry that I've forgotten your name. I, I don't mean to forget your name, but it sort of happened, and I should have written it down. My bad. I can't necessarily take credit for this because somebody pointed this out in the YouTube comments uh, recently, and I thought it was awesome i thought it was really awesome so let me let me actually uh read it to you um while i'm typing it out at the same time but basically um um the uh, the ego so your ego the, the 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 primary side of your mind the ego is in access with your subconscious right and then uh it is also um the ego is in orbit with your unconscious or also known as the shadow right and your ego is a reflection of your super ego so the ego is in access with your subconscious the ego is in orbit with your unconscious and your ego is the reflection of your super ego right so this helps you understand kind of where your cognition is in the relationship with the other four sides of your mind if your ego is actually the point of origin with which most people operate, which it really is, unless of course something bad happens and all of a sudden your super ego flips with your ego, they completely flip roles because you had a head injury or something, which can happen. I have had two coaching clients in history of my practice where that has happened. Someone suffered severe abuse and they just literally flipped and it was kind of interesting and kind of scary. And I even had the opportunity to speak to their uh, to their spouse as well in, in one of those situations, in one of those sessions. And it was absolutely fascinating to kind of see how their spouse reacted to this entire mental change as to what's going on. And uh, I, I'm sure there was plenty of challenge to be had within the context of that marriage because of this huge cognitive change, right? Uh, but either way, it's... It's definitely something that is mega fascinating to me. Um, and I think, you know, over time as people grow and whatnot, like I said, you know, it doesn't matter what the compatibility or even the camaraderie of a relationship is, unless, of course, you get to the point where, you know, it's like, hey, I, I mean, are you, are you being immature about it? Are you being mature about it? Because the more mature you are, technically, you should be able to handle those relationships. And that's, you know, it is what it is. Um, so anyway... But that takes us back, you know, into cognitive reflection and cognitive reflection, you know, just because I didn't really have it as concise in the previous episode. Uh, reflector functions, you know, they express behavior. They exhibit behavior. They're not really used to develop behavior. They're all about behavioral expression or behavioral uh, exhibiting. That's all it is. Uh, and like I said, you know, in general, you can use the parent function as the barometer uh, or the measure of, you know, how developed a person is usually. But the absolute best measure, the absolute best barometer of measuring someone's cognitive development is really how they handle their cognitive reflections, how they handle their cognitive functions, and uh, the various uh, different ways of, of going about it, right? Uh, and with all the different, with the four battlegrounds and, you know, okay, are they, are they using it in a more negative way? Are they using it more a positive way? It will actually tell you overall how well developed or how 
mature or how far someone is on their path to enlightenment and integration, probably more than anywhere else. Sure, we talk about cognitive transitions. Sure, we talk about being able to develop your gateway functions. We talk all about that and those are very, very important. But at the end of the day, those don't always exhibit behavior because cognitive transition is very finite. It happens sometimes, it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen like every single second. Although some people in certain situations, in high stress situations, they can cognitive transition rapidly between the four sides of the mind with healthy gateways to be able to solve that issue. But predominantly, most people are just sitting in their ego. Predominantly, they want to you know, be laying on the couch in their ego, just hanging out. You know, It doesn't matter. They just like hanging out in their ego. That's typically what happens. Me, however, with the amount of stress that I put on myself, I kind of hang out. I don't really often hang out in my ego, honestly. So I end up having to go into my ego to like just, well, it's hard to like even calm down sometimes. It's kind of weird. If you want to calm me down, you just give me caffeine. Yeah, it's because I go ISFJ behind the scenes mode and I'm just like, ugh, you know. But if you want to like make me not calm down and uh, just help me focus a bit more, you give me some alcohol because it puts me more towards my INTJ focused side of my mind, right? Because NI, nemesis, or NI itself is the focus function. It's where focus comes from. Concentration, which is not the same as focus, concentration is self-discipline and that's introverted sensing, okay? So it's a completely different thing. That being said, uh, reflector functions predominantly express behavior and it will help you, they're like, uh, they're indicators of a person's actual development. It indicates where they are in their own development throughout the journey. But the reflective functions, when they're being used or the, or, the, uh, um, or the relationships that they have with one another, they're not for developing behavior. That's what cognitive orbit is for. That's what cognitive axis is for. You develop in that way, gateway functions, et cetera, uh, uh, cognitive transitioning. Those are the tools that a person uses for development. But cognitive reflection is just like what happens based on a certain person, you know, on a person's level of development, where they are in their life, basically, the reflector functions is basically how they express their behavior, ultimately. Uh, because sometimes, you know, when they're making decisions, they'll substitute out certain functions for other functions, you know, when making those decisions. And that could be a problem, right? So uh, understand that it's a thing. It's, it's a risk that comes in there. A lot of people, I'm, I assume, would start to believe that the four battlegrounds are areas um, from which uh, cognitive development can come from, but it's not true. It's not true. The battlegrounds are not for developing. They're not, the battlegrounds are named the battlegrounds for a reason. The battlegrounds are not about uh, tutelage. It's not about growth. It's not about learning. It's to fight. It's to express. It's to exhibit behavior. That's why they're called battlegrounds. You see what I'm saying? So anyway, I just wanted to get this part of the uh, you know lecture in because it's not something we went into depth within episode one per se, and I kind of need to give a little bit more built within the foundation behind what reflector functions are, so that we can actually you know move forward with this understanding, right? So just remember, in terms of areas of development and things that can be developed, look to axis and orbit for that, transitions, gateway functions, et cetera, the like stuff that we talk about in season 19 and season 22, et cetera. Uh, but in terms of just behavioral, raw, raw behavioral expression, reflector functions. That's where it's all about. And we're gonna be talking about raw uh, behavioral expression right now with uh, extroverted sensing versus extroverted intuition which is great because that's my wife. And that's also, uh, uh, that's also like literally everyone in terms, and I say that's my wife because I, I'm talking about that's her battleground of Titans, right? Whereas for me, it's a little bit different. Oh, wait, it's not because it's my battleground too, because my hero, it's just, it's the reverse. It's the reverse of the hero and the demon basically. So let's, let's discuss that. Um, okay. Um, uh, let's get to, uh, need to actually write a reminder here. To go both directions if possible. So there's, there's a lot to discuss. So experted sensing, experted sensing is a person's 
awareness of uh, performance, uh, having shared experiences with other people. Uh, they don't want to be uh, abandoned. They want people to stick around for them. They want to be able to have that freedom of choice. And even though it creates consequences for other people around them, even creates responsibilities for other people around them, that those people are strong enough and capable enough to handle those responsibilities, to handle those negative consequences that could be caused by extroverted sensing as a result of the SE user using their introverted intuition uh, decision making. That's a thing. That's a risk, right? So with that being said, uh, it's it's important to be aware of that. But you know, you look at any hero, it's all about desirability. It's about what other people want consistently. And introverted sensing exists there as an inferior function. And uh, that inferior function, it's uh, like, you know, in terms, or it, it could be a child, it could be anywhere. It's always linked to expert intuition within the same side of the mind. But the difference is, is that the more effort that I put in, the more desirable I am, right? Right. Well, not always, right? You know, or the more risks I take, the less consequences made for other people, right? Or the better, uh, the better the experience, right? The more risks I take, the, the better the experience, right? The better the consequence, the better the, the effect, right? The bigger the cause, the bigger the effect, right? You know, cause and effect awareness, which is what expert sensing is, right? No. So look, there's a huge difference between SE and NE. The biggest difference is the fact that extroverted sensing itself, okay, is all about reactions, cause and effect. It's about awareness of the effects, but it's the short-term effects. It's the immediate effects, right? And that's all they care about because to them, the immediate, the immediate effects is what is real. However, expert intuition is the opposite. The expert intuition goes further. Expert intuition is the consequences. It is the long-term effects, the long-term consequences, right? So you have basic immediate effects versus long-term effects, consequences versus reactions, right? Consequences and reactions. That is what this second reflection actually is, right? And this reflection exists in all of the 16 types, and we're going to be discussing their behavior in all of the 16 types, literally right now, and uh, their attitudes. And hopefully uh, we'll have enough time to actually discuss uh, negative examples of those reflections and positive examples of those reflections as well.